Okay, hey guys. Um, welcome to the session on the origin of life. How are you doing? Doing great, Lewis. How are you doing? Good. You ready to talk about uh, how it all began? I, I want to know where life started. Okay, well, uh, we're going to see. So, um, today we're going to be talking about a bunch of different things. Uh, we're going to be talking about what is life generally, a bit of spiraling from the first trimester, um, criteria for living things. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, what might have been the first biological molecules. Um, notice the word might, that's pretty important there. What might uh, have come, how might living have come from non-living? Um, that's a big question too, you know, how do we get, this, is a, this concept is called abiogenesis. A of course meaning without, bio meaning life, and genesis meaning creation. Like how do we get life created from not life? Um, so we'll be talking about that. Um, and then uh, how could simple uh, life develop into complex cells? Like how could we take the most basic um, structure that you could kind of classify as life and say, okay, how do we get from that to um, the wonderful examples of living things that you and I are? Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. It's, I think it's really important to say at the start, this is not a theology or philosophy Right. lesson like we're not covering that in this um, we're just going to be looking at um, theories that scientists have for how abiogenesis might have come about um, and uh, this is one of the big key things that we're going to really be thinking about is this kind of might part because of course it's very difficult to identify exactly what happened right because nobody was there to record it and it's very difficult to fully simulate the conditions of early Earth. So probably the best thing for us to do is to go back in time. So Let's go back in time. Okay, well I'm glad to see that you've come dressed for the event. Um, so we're going to go back in time um, right after we talked about this. <laughs> so, uh, so first of all, uh, we need to know what we're going to. Well, I mean, this is back in time. I mean, really, this is back to like try one at the very beginning okay. of the year. So, I mean, so we're not. We haven't got all the way back in time. Okay, that's coming in a moment. Um, we're going back a little bit. Yeah, but before we go all the way back in time, we need to really establish like what is life. And uh, do you recognize her? That, is that Mrs. Higo? That is Mrs. Higo. Yes, of course, we all know who Mrs. Higo is. We all know and love her very well. But in case. Um, you happen to have forgotten because you just don't care about such things. And I, just, I mean, how did you not care about Mrs. Higo? I don't know, but the, I feel like there's someone out there who might not care about such things. Um, Mrs. Higo stands for the criteria for living things. Different textbooks are going to write these down in different sure. ways. They're going to include things or not include things. Um, as an aggregate of the different textbooks I've read, um, these are the things that I think are really, um, they come up yeah. all the time. So the first thing, membrane-bound cells, right? right? All life as we know it, comes packaged, okay, it's like Christmas. Uh, it always comes inside a package, it's always inside a membrane bound cell. So that's our first one. Next one, they respire. Uh, all cells release energy in some form. Respiration does take different forms, um, but a release of energy, remember folks, don't say creates energy, it releases energy every time we say creates energy a physics teacher somewhere in the world dies. Yeah, um, so it's good. very important, do not say that, okay? It releases energy by respiration. Next up, sensitivity. Um, so all living things respond to their environment um, in different ways. You may think, well, you know, if I yell at a tree, it doesn't move out of the way. Um, but they still are responding, they change according to their environment, they kind of live in a slightly different time scale to us. Um, and so, yeah, it's difficult sometimes to see how, but all living things do respond to their environment and um, change based on it. Uh, linked to that is maintaining their own internal conditions, homeostasis. So homeostasis is um, things like temperature control, controlling uh, the amount of water inside the living organism, all of those things, right? Um, they're things that actually make us do what we do, you know, we, when we're hot we take off our, our sweatshirt, when we're, when we're cold we put on a coat. Um, you shiver. And we shiver, yes, and, there, and we, so there's behavioral things, there's also stuff that happens that we don't have control over, um, shivering, sweating, um, and that's just temperature, okay, obviously kidneys involved in controlling water, there's all kinds of different stuff uh, that take place. Uh, the next one is evolving. 
So evolving is changing over time. All organisms, or not rather, all organisms, all populations change over time. This is an important concept, okay? Remember, a single organism itself can't evolve. Populations evolve over time. That's the smallest unit of uh, evolution. So natural selection acts on them. Those that are best suited for their particular environments pass on more likely to survive, more likely to pass on their genes um, to the next generation, and so continue that trait onwards. Um, a lot of students remember have that misconception that the individual organism is trying, but it's kind of you know trying, but that's very Lamarckian, and I want to steer away from that. Okay. All organisms grow and reproduce. Um, straightforward. Okay. You don't grow um, and you get killed. You don't reproduce. You get killed. You wiped out. It's not going to maintain itself. And then finally, this kind of hodgepodge that we call organized complexity. Everything else. Um, Everything that is living that we know of is complex and organized. And I think that's probably the biggest of these things in a way, that's possibly the biggest stumbling block for explaining how life started. Because abiotic, non-living, is generally not very complex. And bio, living things, is really complex. Immense complexity. Okay, yeah, especially, you know, all you bio-ex students are feeling the complexity right now. Um, and, uh, and this kind of gap is, is what we're going to be talking about today. Like, how do we get this complexity? How, how is this Where come about? Where does it originate Exactly, how does it come about? Um, and so now, now we're going to go seriously back in time. So further back. Further back in time. Further back so in time. A long, long way back. We're going to go all the way back to uh, in our uh, in our TARDIS, of course, oh, Doctor Who fans, right. um, absolutely. Um, all the way back, we should really have the theme music playing here. Oh. There we go. And uh, no, that wasn't Doctor Who. That was uh, never mind. Anyway, all the way back to um, Ooh, it's hot. this period. Yeah, yeah. Are you breathing okay? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Okay. So not much oxygen in this atmosphere. All right. Um, early Earth. Okay, uh, yeah, it's hot, it's fiery. This is not a particularly good place for life to exist. And yet we think that life came about pretty shortly after events like this were happening, right? When the atmosphere wasn't fully developed, so lots more meteorites were striking the Earth. Um, when, uh, when the crust was just starting to form and so there was a lot more um, molten rock around, just, just really not a great place to be, but it's believed that over time with cooling, Earth turned Ooh. into, yeah. I feel a lot better. Yeah, this is a much nicer place to be, right? We've got shallow seas forming, still got a lot of volcanic activity. Um, and what would come with that, which is going to be relevant in a moment, with volcanoes we get pairings of extra lightning, um, so that's going to be important. But uh, you may still be struggling to breathe right now, um, because this atmosphere doesn't have a lot of oxygen in it. Now we can tell that from uh, evidence by looking at the rocks um, and looking at the looking at, yeah looking at the, at the mineral rocks, composition, and the mineral composition, etc. There was not a lot of oxygen around at this time. Okay, so very different. Um, we think of you know respiration as being mainly aerobic because of how efficient aerobic respiration is, of course, and this um, goes totally against that. Exactly, exactly. So um, it's in this environment. Uh, that we have the first kind of theories of how life got here because this is when life first turns up and uh, some folks uh, think that life got here through um, a theory known as panspermia okay uh, comedic word uh, but panspermia basically this idea is that life came from space okay um, so this cartoon is kind of slightly making fun of that but is this a completely implausible idea not totally. Not totally implausible, right? Whoa, that's weird. Anyway, um, so space is a pretty inhospitable environment, right? It's, uh, you put an elephant up in space, its blood is going to boil instantly um, because, of the, uh, because of the vacuum of space. It's not going to be able to breathe. Um, but not only those kind of instant death kind of things, um, it's going to, uh, the UV radiation um, and gamma rays and all this stuff from the sun are going to shred the DNA of any organism in space. So you would think, not really plausible, right? Um, no. This is this is one of the things that we're actually concerned about yeah. sending people to Mars um, and on long space uh, journeys is the fact that their 
with DNA could be really badly damaged and how do we shield those effects and all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, so, so, more likely. so well, well before before we get to that, um, I think there's a couple of things with panspermia to think about. Yep. One is um, it's if we say life came from space, it's like well okay well then what? Like how well, did life it, must have started there? Like how did it start somewhere else? You right. know we're still we still are left with the big questions. Um, one other thing that I would really strongly encourage you guys to do, um, who are watching this, is to um, go and check out tardigrades. Tardigrades are also known as moss piglets or water bears. Um, these are crazy organisms. Just yeah. look how cute that thing is for a start. But it is actually easily, easily the toughest organism on earth. Yes. Um, you need to go to this YouTube website, uh, a YouTube video, and watch the video, um, it's an awesome science SciShow episode about tardigrades, and tardigrades, um, as they talk about in the video, have been taken into space, left in the vacuum of space, albeit in their dormant form, left in the vacuum of space, um, exposed to all of that radiation, and yet still survived, like amazing, a week later or something, or like a yeah. month later, just insane that they could do that. So, is space travel imposs impossible for organisms? Probably not. Did it happen? Again, we can't say. We Again, we know. can't say. But let's assume for the moment that life started here on Earth. You know, it's a pretty good place to live. It and is. So, uh, so let's let's assume that. What's our recipe for life? Like, what do you need? What are the core ingredients if you were going to do this? Um, so I looked up recipe for okay. life, and uh, this is this is what I got. Um, Oh, that's, Pinch that's of patience, fantastic. a dash of kindness, a spoonful of laughter, and a heap of love. Directions combine all of the ingredients and consume happily. Sounds like a good student too. Daily too. for a healthy life filled with positive. Yes, the, mm, not exactly what I was looking for. Um, I'm sorry to disappoint you guys with the, but we're going to move away from the. Oh, heart. different type of life. Yeah, less with the heart shaped oh, right, spoons right. and more and more something like this. Oh, right? okay. These are the elements that make up uh, the large proportion of living organisms, right? Carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen are the most abundant, and then we have a lot of sulfur and phosphorus in us as well, of course. Uh, the sulfur, a critical part of protein, and the phosphorus, a critical part of nucleic acids. And we think that um, what you need is a warm, moist environment, like the early conditions of Earth, with drying out occasionally, lots of time, lots of time, this is not something you're going to be able to cook tonight, um, and energy, okay? We need some energy source. Uh, and allow to combine orderly pattern ways. Uh, at that point, the recipe is going to get a bit kind of like... Well, Throw it all together. Yeah, we don't really know what happened. But there's a few scientists who've really tried to start, um, start looking at this. And the first place to look, of course, is well, what was present. Earth's early atmosphere, we talked about earlier, is quite different from this right. current one. They don't see any oxygen. Yes, exactly. That's the big thing that's missing, right? Um, we would expect lots more nitrogen and uh, a lot more oxygen than you see there. Okay, lots of water vapor, methane, ammonia, hydrogen. These are all um, these are molecules that we see um, at the moment, but uh, but not in that kind of abundance. Our current atmosphere is an oxidizing atmosphere. It's one where um, we have a lot of oxygen present, yeah. and oxygen accepts electrons. Remember, that's what oxidizing means. And it's thought that this was a reducing atmosphere. Oh, it's very different. Yeah, yeah, completely different because it's going to give off electrons. It's going to give them up. So, um, so what a couple of scientists have done, um, uh, Yuri Miller, um, these two, uh, these two um, hip-looking guys, all the best biologists have less hair. That's right. Uh, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, these two guys, uh, I guess they're, maybe they're more chemists. I'm not uh, sure. A little more chemists, but anyway. We'll accept them. Yeah, they can, you know, we accept them. Uh, even if you do have more hair than us. Um, so what uh, they did was they put this, um, they had this primitive atmosphere right here, okay? The water, the methane, the ammonia, the hydrogen, the carbon monoxide. And uh, they used a vacuum pump to suck out all of the oxygen. Yep. And then uh, pumped it through this uh, bulb, and as they pumped it through here, they put in little um, sparks, which were supposed to represent the lightning that would have been present because of all, all these volcanic eruptions um, early in Earth's atmosphere. They then condensed it, 
um, then they heated it up um, as, as kind of like boiling water in yeah. an ocean and round and round and round it went and you can see that they've got here here and here um, a couple of places where they could take samples out and they kept this experiment running for a while and they just put in these really basic molecules and at the end they end up with amino acids amazing yeah yeah so I guess this is saying a few things this is saying the amino acids can form without from these simple molecules from these very simple molecules without life forming them right right now the, are these molecules alive absolutely okay they, but these are the very kind of basic building blocks of life you know I've, I've told I've told my students the best way to introduce say hi to someone is to tell them they're looking very protein right we are protein and right. protein is that's my made of, exactly that's what protein is and protein is made of amino acids and here we have amino acids now they actually found 25 different amino acids and we have 20 in our bodies um, part of that is because um, amino acids come in two different isomers uh, they are an enantiomers of each other. They're um, either left-handed or right-handed. And all of ours, um, I believe are left-handed. I believe that's true. Yeah. All of ours um, are the same way round, which actually, interestingly, is the same for all life on Earth. And so that suggests a common ancestry, right? You right. can have right-handed amino acids, um, but we're all... Well, we all see them the same. We all see them the same. We all use the same type. We all generate the same type. So while amino acids are synthesized by living organisms, um, it's shown that they can be synthesized through inorganic means. And this was really significant because you need these basic molecules to be able to form without a living thing if we're going to say that we have life from non-life, okay, abiogenesis. So um, Darwin actually started to talk about um, how the very first cells might have existed in his, um, in his writings. And uh, he talked about it as a soup. Okay, you, you may have heard of this, the primordial soup that uh, we like have seen here. Yeah, yeah, like on the left hand side right here. Okay, so this is I took a nice picture of some kind of bubbly thing. Yeah. Um, but the idea is that all of these molecules were together in some kind of sludge and somehow lots of first, mixing. Lots of mixing. The first cells came out of that. Now scientists lean more towards a kind of surface idea. Now this could be. When we're talking about surfaces, this doesn't necessarily have to be like a solid, flat surface. This could be particles. Yeah. Um, but the idea is that maybe through kind of like this is a this is a spring of uh, a mud. Uh, oh, mud pots. Mud pots. Yeah. Um, that uh, in these environments where you have metals present um, and you have clay and you have these all this surface. We know surface area is really important right. in biology, right? That uh, that that would be an environment that's more conducive to the catalysis that you're going to need for life to exist. So scientists are moving that way. I mean, really connecting to metals being catalytic. Yeah, absolutely, right? which, which, which was covered probably, I hope, in chemistry, um, right, that, uh, that metals are often act as catalysts and there'd be a lot of metals in an environment like this. Another place that you'd find a lot of metals, um, which is, I find moderately convincing as a, as a good start point, uh, are undersea thermal vents. So these weren't discovered until I think the 1970s. Um, until then, we had thought that all life on Earth depended directly on the sun, right? Food chains, food webs. Um, you always have your producer at the bottom, and the right. producer is a photo autotroph. It's an autotroph that relies on photosynthesis of some form. And we knew there were different types of photosynthesis, but um, but now, I mean, deep under the sea, I'm not going to be a photo Exactly. It's incredibly dark down there. And so these are chemo autotrophs. They're using chemical energy from these hydrothermal vents. Um, and these vents are super, super cool, right? Um, I've got a little video on here. You can see these um, sulfur dioxides, hydrogen sulfide um, uh, coming bubbling up, these metal ions coming up um, through these kind of chimney stacks. And around the chimneys, we get a huge amount of life. These things, these tube worms grow around them. These tube worms are feeding on bacteria, so they're heterotrophs themselves. But the bacteria are the chemoautotrophs. And I mean, you often find right life here that you find nowhere else in the world. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So these are this is very unique. We'll also get in big crab communities and other things down there. And so these chemoautotrophs relying on chemicals rather than light. 
And it may be somehow that in this environment, this is actually more, um, more conducive because instead of maybe having lightning provide that initial spark of energy. For there was these chemicals that were all present, so these the heat, mm -hmm. the mixing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of that. Um, and I think there's one thing that relates into this that, that's really interesting, and that's the polymerase chain reaction. So we may not have covered the polymerase chain reaction in class yet, um, but polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, is a means of copying um, DNA. Okay. Humans use it, we use it uh, in forensics, we use it in um, all kinds of DNA technology. It's super, super useful technique. Yeah. Um, we can even do it in school. It, it's very straightforward. What we do is we heat up the DNA to split it, and then we cool it down to allow uh, primers to adhere, uh, anneal to it, um, to stick to it, and then we warm it up a little bit so that... Um, not as hot as we did before. Not as hot as we did before, so that a DNA polymerase can run along it and produce it by semi-conservative replication, produce a um, complementary strand. We get two copies, and we can do this again and again and again, and just literally overnight we can create Millions and billions of copies. Of exactly, that. loads it's and loads and loads. So it's a really useful technique. But one thing I think that's interesting is that when we think about hydrothermal vents, right? You've got the water around here circulating. They go, they go next to the vent. It heats up, and then as they move away and the water cools down, then it falls around the vents, and you basically get this cycling of currents around the heating, vents. Heating, cooling, heating, cooling, heating, cooling. And it may be that in this environment you get what's referred to as natural PCR this idea that maybe the molecules are being split up and then they're condensing, that we get polymerization and then splitting up again, and that in this environment we may be able to produce polymers. It's an interesting idea, um, and I think it's one that's got, you know, something worth exploring. I'd be really interested to see whether, you know, you dump a bunch of DNA next to this, see whether it, you know, what happens? you know, obviously you need your primers, you need your... We can't really but how do those molecules come together? And yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be, it'd, be, it'd be fun to play around with it. So one of the key questions with then with the origin of life is: Is life? Um, did life start with metabolic processes or genetic processes? Right? Was it about something that was a series of chemical reactions like Krebs cycle, uh -huh. where energy is being released, released? Remember, not made. Um, or is it genetic, where we've got something that's coding, making copies of itself. Because both of these things are completely fundamental right. to life, right? Mrs. And two Heath, different processes. Two very different processes, and both related to Mrs. Hugo, but yeah. different. So you've got a bit of a kind of chicken and egg thing. That's it's right. Like which, which one came first? How did, how did this are come Are we making about? compounds, or do we have the information? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do we, do we provide energy? Do we provide info? Yeah. Um, and generally, scientific consensus is kind of moving towards an idea that it's some kind of combination of these two. That both of these things needed to happen together, or close to the same time. No, you know, that's sure. difficult. You, you, you need complicated conditions to generate both. Um, but I think there's some, um, yeah, that, that's, that's what we need, yeah. is, is both of those things happening. So we've already had basic molecules, we've already had amino acids right. and some other organic molecules that we see, like carbon dioxide and other things, but we need to know what was the first complex molecule, right? And like we've been trained from birth that DNA carries the instructions for life, right. um, so therefore it must be DNA, right? Because that's what all, all daily life is about, it's about instructions, it's about who I am and passing that on, and Darwin would have said, you know, that's really important, of course he didn't know about DNA, but he knew that traits being passed on was a critical function of life. So is that true? Or? Well, I mean, that seems like awfully complex to yeah. start right to there. Yeah, it's it's complicated, but you know, maybe it was a simpler form. Oh, yeah. Okay. The, the, here's the thing with DNA, though. DNA, as we said in class, DNA is like a book, right? Right. And if I had put a book on the side, it does nothing. It true. just sits there and does nothing. It hangs out in the library. Exactly. So what? So what? Um, what reads DNA? Uh, we've got a, a polymerase. Exactly, a polymerase, an enzyme, a protein. Right, you've got to have proteins. So maybe, maybe it was a protein. Okay, um, maybe it's some. This picture, by the way, is not to skeletal. That protein should be much, much bigger than the DNA. But so you think protein came first? Well, so here's the problem. Okay, so you need another the, chicken egg. Yeah, because you need the protein to read the DNA. Right. 
but the DNA carries the code to make that protein. So, yeah, well, how, how, do we, how are we linking these? Yeah, you need DNA to make protein, and you need protein to make DNA. So, these two are completely linked, right? We've come across this one, here, this, this particular enzyme here, this is our RNA polymerase, the protein, and the DNA right here. I think the critical thing to realize is that in this picture, there's another molecule. Yeah, we've got the RNA. Exactly. The RNA that's being formed here. And RNA, unlike DNA or protein, has a kind of dual function, right? RNA can act as an enzyme. It can right. speed things up, um, called a ribozyme. Um, an example of that is a ribosome. Yeah, we can see that with rRNA. Yeah, rRNA in the ribosome. Now, in the ribosome, of course, it's there's protein that's part of the ribosome right. too. But the RNA has catalytic properties. Yeah. It's speeding up this protein translation, this protein synthesis. So um, it can do that. But then it also has the function that it can carry information. And really, so it's this kind of golden molecule, right? It fits the criteria, these two things that we need. We need catalysis and we need information. Um, so this is, has come to be known as the RNA world hypothesis, OK? DNA gets all the kind of kudos now, mm -hmm. um, and, and protein is what we see, but perhaps in the past really the most critical thing, I, I guess you probably could still argue that it is, but the dominant thing in the past was the RNA. Um, so not getting a lot of love these days. No, not, not nearly enough. Not enough press at all. Certainly RNA is funky stuff because it can do those two things. So the idea is that somehow we get polymerization of RNA nuclear. So RNA nucleotides form through these kind of Miller-Urey uh, experiments, um, and that they polymerize somehow. Okay, they come together, and uh, we'll talk more about kind of how that might happen using metal catalysts in a moment. We've got a video for that. Um, but through this process, we get a polymer of RNA. Okay, and that polymer of RNA self-replicates. Okay, in other words, it's a ribozyme that makes more ribosomes. Now, we don't have one of those. We've tried making them, um, but we don't have RNA that makes copies of itself. Right. We're close. We've got an RNA um, molecule, and you're, there's an article in the link in a moment. There's an RNA molecule that can copy a length of RNA up to half its own length. So I'm guessing that maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 soon, years, soon. hopefully soon, um, we'll have a molecule that can self-replicate, and that will be big. And that would really help to prove this. Yeah, well, or certainly provide yeah, really, yeah, really strong evidence. evidence. More strong evidence, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, the other thing that you need your RNA to be doing is catalyzing protein synthesis, okay? Because as soon as we get proteins in the picture, we, kind of, we can develop complex cell membranes, we can develop uh, enzymes that get jobs done, and really, when we have these things, when we've got a molecule that can self-replicate, in fact, probably that's the most basic step. Right. When we have that first step, natural selection kicks in, right? The molecules that are better able to replicate themselves are going to survive. Right. Survive, and they're not alive, but you know, they're able to self-replicate um, more successfully, and so will become more ubiquitous, and then maybe there'll be a slight change that causes them to also produce a particular protein that makes them slightly better and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. okay. Now this is all happening without membranes at the moment, potentially. And uh, membranes are really important for life, right? Mrs. Higo, membrane bound cell. We need membrane formation happening so that inside there we can get our unique environment. We can get our unique environment, homeostasis yeah. and moving on to life. So we'll talk more about the membrane formation, but somehow within that membrane then we need to trap the RNA. And RNA is going to start coding for both DNA and proteins. DNA becoming the master template. That's the great thing about DNA, is it's more stable than RNA. Yeah. So it can it can last for longer, it can um, yeah, it, it'll just remain intact for longer. Proteins um, are able to catalyze cellular activities probably more efficiently than RNA right. is. And so you need that. And once you get to this point, then we can really start. Everything explodes, right? You're gonna get really fast success. And 
one of the things that comes up is, well, if life can occur spontaneously, why doesn't it happen all the time? That's a great but, question. Yeah, I think it's a really valid question, but perhaps the reason is that it's difficult to get to this point. Yeah. But when you get to this point, you're going to easily outcompete anything that hasn't quite got to right, this Right, it's point. below you. That's below you, right? The first one to make it to this... You're gone. You're on. You, yeah. Boom, 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 boom. You're going to... You're going to... Um, you're going to start breaking down. down. You're going to break down all these yeah. other molecules that are around you. You're going to start synthesizing them se into yourself, right? Um, and you're going to become very successful and you're going to spread. And probably at that point, you get, you know, you get an explosion of life. And this is what we kind of see in the fossil record is, is this kind of suddenly burst, this bacteria everywhere. You know, there wasn't any and then boom. And, and I wonder if it's this. Because, of course, we can't see before this right. because, you know, RNA is not going to polymerize. Uh, sorry, it's not going to fossilize. And uh, if there's RNA around, it would be gobbled up by right. these more successful things afterwards. So, so that's potentially why um, this article is about this um, self-replicating, this quest to find self-replicating uh, RNA. The title's a little mis bit misleading, but I strongly recommend uh, reading it. So finally, what about these membranes? Like how yeah. membranes are so critical. To to life because they allow compartmentalization. If you get all these molecules inside the membrane, you can uh, you can create different conditions inside that make your chemical reactions much more efficient right. as a molecule. If you're outside as a molecule and you synthesize something and that just floats away, not good. Yeah, then then you just, and as the environment changes, yeah, yeah, you know? absolutely. So you want to contain everything with inside yourself. Okay. So these membranes are really critical, and membranes, as we know, are made primarily of phospholipids. Really critical, they have this polar head and non-polar fatty acid tails. The polar head then is going to move towards the water because it's hydrophilic, it's charged, non -polar, exactly, and the, and the non-polar fatty acid tails are going to repel the water, and so they're going to bend away from it. And it's found that if you put um, fatty acid tails together, they're going to create these little things called micelles, which are basically you have all the phosphate heads on the outside yeah. and all the fatty acid tails on the inside. And under the right conditions, those can actually form uh, liposomes. So liposomes like this one, this is basically a bubble of phospholipids. And it's so just a membrane, not a cell at this point. Uh, yeah, not even a complex membrane, yeah. right? There's not proteins, not there's not phospholipids, uh, sorry, there's not just have glycolipids, it's just phospholipids, right? This is actually pretty stable. Um, it'll stay together, it can stay together for weeks, if not months. Um, and interestingly, other micelles coming along will make it bigger. Um, and it so, just kind of merge with it. Yeah, and so it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger until actually, ultimately, it'll divide it too. Wow. For cell division. Wow. Exactly. So we've got some cool videos to show you. Hydrothermal vents from deep sea black smokers to landbound geysers may have been sites where prebiotically important molecules on early Earth were formed. This animation shows the formation of fatty acids deep in the Earth below a geyser. Mineral surfaces can catalyze the stepwise formation of hydrocarbon chains from carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Here hydrogen atoms are shown as white spheres. Carbon is gray and oxygen in red. The reaction results in the growth of hydrocarbon chains of various lengths that are eventually released from the mineral face as fatty acids and related compounds. Because the fatty acids are at low concentrations in the water, they are unable to form higher order structures such as micelles and membranes. Following the violent explosion of the geyser, some water is released into the atmosphere as tiny, microscopic droplets. Fatty acids synthesized along the mineral walls of the geyser are found in low concentration in these droplets, with the longer fatty acids at the air-water interface. A gust of wind evaporates the water molecules in the water droplet, causing the fatty acid to form lightweight airborne particulates that can be transported across the landscape, perhaps eventually settling out and accumulating in localized areas. Under the proper conditions of concentration and pH, fatty acid micelles may join together to form a vesicle. Individual micelles first join to create a large, sheet-like bilayer. Random fluctuations of the fatty acid bilayer lead to the formation of a cup-like shape.
proximity, the ends of the sheet can seal together, forming a spherical vessel. Recent research has shown that single nucleotides of RNA are able to traverse fatty acid vesicle membranes. This animation shows one mechanism by which nucleotides may enter the vesicle. Nucleotides bump into and interact with fatty acid head groups, colored in red, in the outer leaflet. Some of the fatty acids interacting with the nucleotide flip to the inner leaflet, carrying the nucleotide along and releasing it on the inside of the vessel. This animation shows the process of protocell growth and division. RNA nucleotides shown as blue dots traverse the protocell membrane and are used by an RNA replicase to make a copy of another RNA replicase. Meanwhile, the protocell membrane is constantly growing through the addition of micelles. Increasing the surface area faster than the volume causes the protocell shape to become elongated and unstable. The protocell eventually splits into daughter protocells, with the contents of the original protocell randomly divided between the daughters. So, pretty cool stuff. That, that was super cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can see those videos and more on our website. We'll give them uh, the link to later on. Um, these things are called stromatolites, and uh, these are the most ancient uh, representation, formation of life um, that we have. Um, these are not soft, they look like they're going to be soft and cushy, but this is actually... Yeah, it looks like a pillow. I, I think this is Shark Bay in Australia, so this is a real place you can go and visit these. And, and what you have is basically, they are just rocks, essentially. Okay. They're just minerals piled on top of each other, so kind of what we would define as a rock. But on the top they have this very, very thin layer of bacteria growing. Um, primitive bacteria. and if you cut through a stromatolite, you see all these layers, bacteria on top of bacteria on top of bacteria, over millions and millions of years. And these bacteria um, have secreted, have you know, from their dead bodies, that you've got this mineral ion buildup, and we can see these layers. And this is really the kind of whenever you look back at earlier the first life, like what did it look like? Um, it was probably very similar to these stromatolites. Okay. So we've got our protocells forming actual cells that are able to replicate. Then we've got the bacteria. And then we've got the bacteria to this, to this and okay. these colonies of bacteria that are building up, uh, which are our prokaryotes. Now we're going to talk a lot more about prokaryotes in a later video, um, and viruses and, and other things. But I just wanted to kind of build from there, because of course, you know, we want the big, big picture. We want the big picture. We want to see like, okay, how do we go from that rock looking thing to this the cells and us. This beautiful thing, yeah. exactly. Um, and so we take our ancestral prokaryote. It's got its DNA inside now. It's pretty, you know, well churning out its RNA. It's got DNA replication down. It's probably got um, binary division down really well. Um, and one thing that we see in prokaryotes, in order to increase the um, number of chemical reactions they can have, right, their photosynthetic ability and their Protein synthesis ability in these things is that we get infoldings of the cell membrane. Yep. Um, and that we see that in prokaryotes that are still around today. Surface area, right? Exactly, exactly, surface area. The answer to everything in bio, if you don't know the answer. Um, and increasing the surface area by having more and more infolds, you get something that starts to look a bit like rough endoplasmic reticulum with that space. Yeah, the endomembrane the, system there? Exactly, the endomembrane for system with that space in the middle. There's a big advantage to this because, again, it's this compartmentalization, um, keeping all the chemical, same chemical reactions together in one place. In different Protect, environments. Exactly, protecting that DNA, which is so critical. And so we get nuclei forming, okay? Endoplasmic reticulum, nucleus in the middle. And I think it's really interesting, this idea that that came from the outer membrane. Now, we've talked about uh, endosymbiosis before in class, but then, of course, we get our our large uh, early cell, ancestral host cell, taking in uh, by endocytosis, by endocytosis, by phagocytosis, um, an ancestral aerobic heterotroph. It's aerobic, it is a prokaryote. Um, and that was prokaryote too, the ancestral host. Y yes, potentially. Well, potentially. well, it's, it's got a nucleus now, so we, I don't we'd, know, we'd, yeah. we'd probably start to say it's eukaryotic because it has a nucleus. Um, but the, the, the mitochondria comes in, and remember, the theory of endosymbiosis has got those critical um, well, I got a couple pieces of evidence. Big things, right? Three pieces of evidence, right? My own DNA? Own DNA, and that's DNA is in a loop. 
So it's like a prokaryotic prokaryo DNA. DNA. Exactly. Um, it's got, its own got a double membrane? Double membrane, which would be the membrane of the original prokaryote plus the membrane of the host cell around. That's showing that I got engulfed? Exactly, showing you got engulfed. And then finally, the, um, the ribosomes. They've got their own ribosomes, they're smaller ribosomes, much like prokaryotic ones. And that becomes like particularly important when we talk about targeting ribosomes in terms of disease and treatment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, because yeah, and you can add a lot of uh, antibacterial, you know, you know antibacterial antibiotics. Uh, which we'll later. get to later. Exactly. So we have our cell, which has got mitochondria in, and these cells, some of them will turn into animal cells and produce this beautiful face. Um, <laughs> and then others will um, take in chloroplasts by a similar mechanism. Um, the, we, know, we know this happened probably afterwards because plant cells have got mitochondria and chloroplasts while animal cells have just got the mitochondria. Um, so it's likely that it happened in that order. Not proof, but, uh, but likely that it did. Um, this photosynthetic oh, might infer that. Yeah, and, and remember this is a symbiotic, endosymbiotic relationship. It's a mutualistic relationship um, because both are benefiting. One's getting protection and resources, and the other one's getting the products of either respiration or photosynthesis, right. depending on which one it is. So, um, there we go. We went from uh, non living all the way through. These molecules. These just, well. Atmosphere. Atmosphere, exactly. All the way through. Really hot. Eukaryotic cells, and uh, it's just a short skip and a jump to. Um, big organisms, okay. um, and complex organisms. This is a great website to read more about this stuff and watch some videos. It's got some of the videos that we showed earlier. Um, and you should go there now and check out all the different articles, um, take notes on them, and uh, yeah, do that. Awesome. Here's the start of life. <laughs> That's it. Okay. See you later.